as people start to join, I'll just make a start and uh, welcome to this month's Construction Cast. We're going to try and make these monthly again, if we possibly can. We'll see how it goes. But um, we've got another one lined up for next month, which um, we don't quite have the final details for. So you, everyone will get an email in due course about that. But thank you all for joining us. I'm um, going to introduce the speakers for today, all the panellists of people who I'm talking to um, in my normal routine with these things which has been a long time so normally we've been doing these in the past every month and it was quite routine and I had a pattern and a system and I did everything very well um I would have a nice biography set up for each speaker and I'd just read it to you but now this month I don't so I'm going to have to make this up on the fly so if I get this all horribly wrong apologies but um very grateful to the three panelists for joining us today we've got Saul Humphrey who um used to be a regional director of Morgan Sindel um, he's now a consultant and wears many hats, lots of exec non-executive directorships and all kinds of things. He was also up for an award recently, and most importantly, he runs a consultancy focusing on sustainability. Um, he was up for the CIOB's Construction Manager of the, the Year Award last year. Um, so we're very grateful to Saul for joining us. Martin Long, some of you may have seen before, I think he may have done one of these in the past. Um, Martin is uh, formerly of Bureau 4 and various... Um, project management and um, organizations. He now runs his own um, company called Ashfold Management Services. And uh, Martin and I have been working together for a little while. We've done some, I did a site visit last night again with the CIOB. It's a bit of a theme in my life. We were at um, Pilgrim Street looking at the sustainability elements of that particular project. And Martin's very keen on ESG and all of those sorts of things. And particularly recently, not that long ago anyway, um, Martin's business like Saul's, in fact, became a B Corp. So that's one of the things we're looking at today is B Corp. We're also looking at ESG and all kinds of things. And also there was an element of me that wanted to talk about the legal aspects because we like to throw in a bit of law into these sessions every time we do them. So um, we've got Kushbu Shadapuri from Altamimi & Co out in Dubai. So somebody emailed this, me this morning saying, I'm, I'm not coming, I'm in Africa, as, as though that was somehow relevant to the conversation. But it doesn't matter where you are in the world, sustainability does still, and uh, ESG and all these lovely things do still have some relevance. And Kushbury was just saying, we've just, um, this ties in nicely with the um, ESG summit that they just had in Dubai. So that's quite nice. So Kushbury is going to join us and, and have a little um, look at the legal side of things. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, um, any of the audience, anybody listening, um, do pop them into the Q&A box. Hopefully that all works for you. Um, and if, if not, send me an email or, or, or just scream and shout. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully the Q&A box is all live and working. I know last time I had this, there was it was turned off for some reason, but um, fingers crossed it's all fine and dandy. Um, so... Kushbu, let's come to you to start with. And enough of my voice, and let's let's hear a little bit from you. So, in terms of what we were talking, so we had a very lively discussion when we were preparing for this. And one of the things was how do we define ESG or CSR, and what's the incentive? I think was one of the things that you were talking about last time was for people to participate, or certainly for firms to participate in in those things, whether legally, commercially, or otherwise. Why, why would people get involved, and why are you finding people getting involved in it? Thank you, Stuart, and good morning and afternoon to everyone joining today's session. So I just think um, there's just so much in what Stuart you've said. I think it's good to take a step back. Uh, and the starting point is that ESG encapsulates a broad range of issues. Collectively, they indicate a company's dedication to achieving a, a positive impact on social issues, or at the very least to be cognizant and conscious of these issues in addition to their profit maximizing aim. Now, generating a financial revenue is the driving force of businesses and no one's gonna take away from that. And that is okay because we do operate in the capitalist economy. But ESG is about shared value. So it's, it's not about social responsibility. It's not about social consciousness or even philanthropy. I mean, all of that are different um, blocks of of items and issues. What ESG really is, is, is probably the new, and I'd say perhaps the better way of achieving economic success. Um, so that's ESG broadly. And, and as some of you may know, there are three very distinct disciplines or pillars of what makes ESG. So we have the E, which is the environment, which is probably I'd say the most highlighted aspect of ESG. So we have climate change, we have uh, carbon emissions, energies, waste disposal, all of these issues going under the environment, E. 
we have the S then, that's the social aspect. And I think that's the most diverse because it's mainly driven by a huge range of issues. We have human rights, labor rights with community, minimizing the impact of indigenous communities getting displaced. And I'll speak about this a little bit in detail later on in the session. And then we have the G, the, gov the governance. And there's probably less clarity in what G is, but it's really about business ethics, about executive pace, about management being aligned with shareholders' expectations, about honoring and respecting shareholders' rights. So that's the G aspect of it. Um, and I think CSR is probably seen as a traditional form of, of ESG. ESG has been a buzzword for the last two, three years. And I think traditionally people saw ESG, sorry, CSR as a form of ESG. And I think that's probably right because CSR is probably the internal strategy of an organization that would then come to form part of ESG. And, and just speaking a little bit about the Middle East region, because that's where I'm based at the moment. Most countries in the GCC have a net zero ambition by 2015, 2060. And in the GCC, family businesses actually make up about 60% of the region's GDP. So then we come to this age old adage. How do we get private sector buy-in for sustainability in their business planning? What's the incentive to create value chains to reduce waste? And um, the way I would see it and most people would probably see it is there's a carrot and stick approach. So we have the subsidies, the incentives, which is a carrot coming from the government. And then the stick approach would be carbon pricing both of which are not without their fair share of difficulties, not least because of the, the dust of regulation and policies that are in play. There's also reputational risks. Um, companies don't want to be seen as being non-complying with ESG standards. So that's been helpful as well, especially in today's day and age of social media, things get reported instantaneously. So that's been quite helpful to see a push towards voluntary compliance with ESG standards. And then we have the government push. And... Um, I mean, one example that comes to mind is Master, which is Abu Dhabi's future energy company, and that they're doing a fantastic job in just paving the way forward through their focus on reducing the demand for energy and water and, and then recycling and reusing. And all of this come together concomitantly to assist in um, compliance with ESG standards. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a nice little helpful summary to bring us in. And I think, yeah, that, that's the thing, isn't it? So the people that do it voluntary, voluntarily and the people that do it for fun sort of thing, which is which is which brings me nicely to Martin and, and Saul, um, who I don't know if it's fun, is perhaps a bit of an extreme word to use. But um, so you guys have, have been involved in various um, initiatives and there's and one of the things that gets me with all of this, and I, I don't know, people get very confused about all the acronyms that ESG and CSR and B Corp and BRIAM and LEED and EPC and WELL, and there's all kinds of certificates, qualifications, standards. What, you know, what's the difference between them all? What are the benefits? And what, should anyone care? Why should anyone care, I guess, is the question. So I guess, Saul, so, so could we start with you and Martin, if you can jump in with your thoughts as well? Glad I've gone in the middle. This, I, I think Kishpu did really well starting it all off, and Martin can now put me right. So this is perfect. Um, <laughs> I think there's a difference with the organizational level commitments, the strategic business commitments, which might be um, captured with CSR or ESG type language um, to commit the organization to follow a, set, a certain pathway. And B Corp is one of those. B Corp. I think the phrase, if you if you achieve it, you get the accolade that this company meets the highest standards of social environmental impact. So it's a nice kudos to say, done, we've proved we're there. But to get there is quite a hard journey. Um, and it does involve aligning everything the business does with all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and much more. So it's quite quite difficult, it's quite cumbersome, it's quite hard to prove and demonstrate compliance. And I don't know you, Martin, but it took me over a year to from start to finish to get there. Um, partly because it's so popular. And I think there's a lot of people now starting that pathway. Um, some of the other acronyms you quoted, I think are much more project specific. They're about in our construction world, does this building seek BRIAM accreditation or well accreditation um, or lead accreditation? And forgive the acronyms, but I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with them, but there is in addition to what Kushbu described as the driving forces as to why you might want to do something, I think there's another imperative, and that's you know, it's good for a business to have a purpose and have a direction. And I think B Corp can help ens enshrine that. 
But I think for a building or a project, for it to have an accolade that it too has achieved the highest standards of environmental performance, probably means it's worth more. I think it's worth more to the occupants. They're going to probably be healthier, happier. They're going to know they're in a low carbon building that's greener and cleaner. And I think it will have a premium value, picking up Mark Carney's work on values. It's not going to be long before a BM outstanding bet building is worth 20, 30% more than a building reg compliant, EPC compliant alternative. So I think we're going to see all buildings trading at a huge discount because they can't demonstrate the greenest credentials. We're going to see the greenest, cleanest buildings trading at a huge premium. So I think there's another imperative to doing this. Um, and it is commercial and there is a real benefit to following a green approach. How does that do, Martin? Thank you. Well, so, so I'm, uh, I'm now lost for words to, uh, to elaborate. So I, I could just be simple and say I agree and then Stuart could ask the next question. I think, <laughs> um, I think probably you've, you've come from a, a large corporate environment and are now um, interested in subjects and have, have made B Corp something that you've felt very strongly about personally. Uh, my journey was was somewhat shorter, I suppose. I started out at Arabs um, and then 30 years later found myself running my own business uh, in, in partly in choice and partly by, by just the nature of events. Um, and I think in running a small business, you're always looking to find um, USPs, things that you can do that the, your competitors maybe uh, are not doing. Uh, and that probably applies to any business, but particularly when you're a small business. Uh, and my story with, with becoming a B Corp was probably slightly easier than yours. Um, I've, I've just been a B Corp now for a year. Uh, so the process of achieving B Corp probably took more like six months rather than a year for me. But you're absolutely right. A small business, it's, it's much easier to bring focus to that process because you just decide what you're doing um, and, and you do it. I think the analogy that you drew about projects versus company is, is well made. I think projects do gain value if they've got good credentials and, and at the moment that is very much about environmental credentials and the, the building that, that Stuart referenced earlier where we made the presentation we have one potential tenant uh, who is very interested in the building because it is a refurbished building um, and it ticks a lot of their boxes and they've got outside terrace space that they can get to and, and get to fresh air and I think through COVID building occupiers have become the perceptions of what makes a good office has changed um, and so people want um, you know lots of green spaces and lots of flexible spaces and, and that is all very interesting and, and I think that will evolve um, around a much more sustainable model. In terms of business I liken B Corp to a bit between uh, if people remember investors and people and QA they're both things that you're structured around doing and, and need to get compliance. But the difference with B Corp is that it didn't come out of uh, another industry. It didn't, it wasn't an institutional thing. It was developed by three guys in California who said there has to be a better way and, and, and create um, uh, an association, if you like, uh, that, that is B Corp. And I think that's much more powerful because it is much more commercial in its approach. And it does co cover uh, all of the things that, that both of you two have alluded to in terms of where you demonstrate your ability to comply. And it, it isn't necessarily you're perfect in every division, but you're doing more than enough in a, in a wide range of divisions. So you have to be able to demonstrate that you are active in all the areas associated with, as we've mentioned, the E, the S and the G. And I think that gives it an interest. And it's not the other really big thing is that it's not industry specific. So it's, it spans across a lot of different industries and a lot of different locations, although obviously it originated in the US. Brilliant, thank you. I think, yeah, that's one of the things with the, um, the ISO that we always used to find out. I think it has got better over the years, hasn't it? But it was, it was always very manufacturing focused. And so to bring in a professional services business into the, the ISO 9001 system was very complicated to try and shoehorn your your way of doing things into some of the more manufacturing focused concepts. It still is. It still is. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, da, 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 where are we? So, yeah. So that that's helpful. I think um, yeah. One of the things on this, one of the questions that I'd like to ask you guys as well. So you've obviously both got relatively small businesses and. It took Saul a year, it took you about six months or so. 
How hard do you think it would then be to transfer that onto a larger business with, you know, say, I don't know how many, you know, well, in Saul's case, where you came from, the Morgan Sindel of the world, which is huge, and some of the uh, larger consultancies that you were at, Martin, do you, do you think it would be particularly more challenging to, to, to introduce something like B Corp to one of those organisations? Yeah, no, I think I think it is. I think the the bigger organisations are are just getting going in our construction sector. So AKT two have most recently done it. Um, I suspect they would be a good example of somebody that at the top, the the level of commitment would have been very high, but they would have then had to have made sure that where it got delegated to the actual doing, that the people who were doing it also shared the ambition and actually understood that it wasn't just another greenwash tick box exercise that it will involve the company having to demonstrate actual I mean the, the really interesting thing for me in doing the process was that it's very structured around you you have to score a minimum score you then have to demonstrate how you got to that score and they drill down and ask subsequent questions you said you do good call you support good causes now give us an example and show an invoice where you have contributed to a good cause and that's you know that for a big business that's quite hard because we bigger businesses can get away with saying yes well of course we do that in our office in wherever or you know we've got people in the business who do that but when you get asked yeah but what are they actually doing and what what difference are they making i'd imagine for a large organization that's going to be quite hard to capture but having said that the infrastructure around the isgs and the morgan Sindels, there are sustainability groups who you'd probably give it to and say right well you now have to to draft the appropriate paperwork you have to put in place the the hr policies you have to put in place the other work that's needed to determine how much uh, we spend on energy or how much we you know where our water comes from those are going to be quite tricky questions and involve a lot of people in the business to get the answers just to um supplement that Martin, i would also say that morgan sendel and companies like them have, have got a very clear net zero agenda too um it often, though, focuses on their operational um, impacts and not necessarily the embodied impacts of what it is that they're building. And there is a certain hypocrisy um, to placing lots of concrete and erecting lots of steel um, whilst claiming net zero. It's it's difficult um, to square that circle. And I think it's another challenge when you're a PLC and you're taking shareholders with you. Um, the B Corp journey does involve um, um, changing the articles of association to align the business's ethos and direction towards a triple bottom line type approach. Um, it, it might worry some shareholders who are only focused on returns um, if they think the company's going too soft or too green. Um, however, I think that is the direction of travel and I think lots will do it. There is a separate large enterprise approach with B Corp, um, if your if your turnover is more than a billion pounds, you follow a different pathway. Um, and companies like Ben and Jerry's and others have done it, so you know, it can be done by giants. But I think it's often suggested that you put a subsidiary through first, put put through a part of the business, and get commitment and buy in from there. So I think it can be done, and I, and I hope it is. I hope others follow. I have just come across as a very good book, or well, I haven't read it yet, it's been recommended to me by, um, maybe we can get it on the post, Stuart, but it's uh, by Christopher Marquis, and it's called How the B Corp Movement is Remaking Capitalism. So mm -hmm. I guess the, the title says it all, but apparently one or two other people have read it before they became B or went on the journey to B Corps, and so it's very helpful. It's a, a review of companies that have done it and how they've done it, both large and small. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, so the curse of this half hour format that we have is that we always run out of time, or I always run out of time, since Annie seems to be able to manage it much better than me. I don't know what that says. But anyway, um, I'm going to move on to come back to Kushbu, because one of the things that, you know, Martin, Saul and I are sitting here in the UK, and it's very, we know how the UK structure works, we know what's going on here, roughly. Um, but it'd be nice to hear, Kushbu, what, what the perspective is in the broader international region. So obviously you've got experience of Singapore, but also based in Abu Dhabi, uh, more in Dubai, and then working in Abu Dhabi and King, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I've got KSA in front of me, so I was going to give it its full title, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. What, what's the situation out there? What's going on and what, how, how are things operating in terms of ESG and, and stuff like that out there? Oh, I think the, the standards um, are just so different and, and, and every region operates obviously with different yardsticks. Um, so reporting and disclosure standards differ quite a bit internationally. And, and as a result, yeah, I would say there are somewhat unequal standards of reporting and disclosure obligations. Uh, what is helpful is that 
I think these obligations are increasingly becoming um, a requirement and more so for public listed corporations, wherever they are situated. And I think the UK has, has such a great example. Um, it just enacted a set of financial disclosure regulations which require UK registered companies with more than 500 employees and a turnover of more than 500 million pounds to provide climate related disclosures in their strategic reports. So really positive trends. And then you can see the US having quite similar regulations and policies and not on a federal level, but on states and city level and they have carbon pricing mechanisms and I'd say the, the, the Middle East somewhat straddling behind a little bit. They are looking, UAE, for example, is looking to create its own regulatory journey and create a sustainable framework. They have set up um, action plans. They've set up committees to look to see how they can progress the growth of sustainable finance, circular economies. Um, and one example worth noting, and there are so many, but obviously, you know, we don't have that much time. But one example that's actually worth noting is DIWA, which is the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority. And they have such... Um, innovative carbon calculator which is accessible to all residents and it estimates the potential electricity production and savings on any electricity bill um, that can be achieved by achieving by installing solar panels so that's just um, incredible it compares your carbon footprint of your household vis-a-vis -vis your neighbors and you you get a sense of where you stand and it's such a useful measuring point and yardstick um, and something that came up in our internal discussion a couple of weeks ago was the individual standards that are being used in Dubai and Abu Dhabi when buildings are being built. Um, and the UAE government actually very recently has approved plans to create what's called national building regulations policy. So what, what this does is create uh, on a federal level, a green building code aimed to introduce the same, the, literally the same sustainable standards for buildings, for roads, for homes. And we, we still are waiting further details, including whether compliance with these standards are mandatory, what are the consequences of non-compliance. But the fact that this is being thought of at this point, I mean, that itself is such a welcomed addition. And I, I think it's a positive trend for the Middle East and generally for, I would say, globally as well, as this movement continues. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear that, you know, that the, again, you know, we always think, I think the media if I can use the word, tend to give us the impression that the US doesn't care about the environment and things like that. So it's interesting to hear you mention that the, the US are doing that. And obviously we know, you know, the, the lead and stuff like that is, an, I think, an American thing, isn't it? But yeah, it's really interesting to hear what's going on in different parts of the world and stuff. So thank you very much for that. Um, but in terms of legal stuff, so this is this is the, the, the interesting bit for me, because I'd never even considered that there could be disputes over um, ESG and and so from your perspective Kushbu what 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 does it mean in legal terms and why do disputes arise over it and then what what's yeah what are your thoughts from the legal side of things and what, what are the, the implications on that side? It's a bit of a quagmire at this point for various reasons um, so legal consequences arising from non-compliance of ESG related standards these will depend on whether these standards are voluntary, are they mandatory? And without these standards becoming a binding obligation, either in prescribed regulations and policies or in commercial contracts where these clauses are, are put into the uh, contracts and agreements or in trade agreements even, it's very difficult without any of these being done for ESG-related standards to then become binding obligations and consequently illegal disputes. And all of this needs to happen, I suppose, in parallel. There needs to be uh, leaders need more skin in the game. There needs to be better policies. There needs to be more binding and better defined standards, especially for the S, as someone rightly put in, in this chat box. Um, there is no standard on what social disputes are. It could be anything. You know, It could be labor rights. It could be um, being displaced by my community home because of a really big project. And while that itself is not illegal, what becomes a violation is when there's no proper compensation being given to these communities that are being displaced. Um, so the, the shift just needs to happen to get ESG standards to becoming binding rather than voluntary obligations. Um, and this will then attract legal consequences, will attract financial consequences and concomitantly reputational risks. And as governments increasingly become more unambiguous with these standards, there'll be fines also imposed for failure to comply Investment opportunities will be missed as a consequence. Fundings could be denied. Um, and I'll, I'll share uh, what a quote that um, I heard yesterday from the World Summit in Dubai, the ESG World Summit. 
I, I think um, it was aptly encapsulated by this, the chicken and pig analogy in an English breakfast where the chicken's involved, but the pig is really committed, right? So th this is exactly what, we, what needs to happen. The leaders just need to get more committed. It's, not, it's just not about being peripherally involved. They just have to literally start thinking with communities, with the grassroots and how they can actually um, elevate these standards and just make it highlight them, uh, make them practical, make them feasible. And I think as a, as a concluding point to this whole legal debate that we're having, when ESG related issues become part of the domain of legal proceeding, there needs to be more guidance and jurisprudence on how losses or damages relate, resulting from ESG violations can be quantified. Because the overarching aim of initiating legal proceedings is to seek legal redress, which is to compensate the injured party for their losses. There are obviously exceptions where the purpose of damages is aimed to penalize the wrongdoer rather than compensate the injured party. But generally speaking, the law helps to compensate. And how do we aptly quantify damages arising from these associated environmental, um, social or governance breaches of a company? There needs to be better jurisprudence, there needs to be better guidance around it. And, and this will, of course, happen in time. And there are projects that I'm personally involved in. So I can see with measured optimism that it's going to come, we'll be able to overcome this and bridge this gap very soon. But, but that's just something to think about. How do, what do these losses mean to us? Whether it's a climate change breach, whether it's social rights violation, how do we measure these in terms of a financial amount? Mm. It's really, I think I find that fascinating. I, you know, the the fact that the law comes in every every time something happens, there is always a legal implication. I remember an old lecturer of mine at, at uni was like, "Oh, don't talk about lawyers; they just spoil everything." But it's un <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> the law is something we can't avoid, isn't it? And there's always going to be if somebody puts something as as John Forbes has just commented in the comments there. Is if people put these things in their prospectuses, they have a firm, they get written into a contract something like that you you will end up inevitably and and that's going to happen because people want certainty they want to know if something is going to happen and then the reverse side of that when it doesn't happen they want redress and whether we like it or not the the lawyers will get involved and and that's that's the way of the world um we have two minutes so i'm going to i'm very pleased to say i've got one just very quickly fit in our final question um which was around B Corp, going back to the B Corp thing, and I, I was quite fascinated by the, the brew dog thing that happened before um, Christmas when they got kicked out of um, the, the B Corp system. Has that led to a, a reduction in credibility, credibility, or do you think it's better for the credibility of B Corp? What, how, how do you think that's something that's going to be an issue as more and more organisations become B Corp? Um, accredited or certified, will that water down the, the credibility of B Corp, do you think? I, well, if I, if I grab the moment on that, I, I, I don't think so. I think they acted very swiftly and the removal was um, appropriate. Um, I think it was the G that they were, question, were failed on or were deemed to have failed on. And I think this is the problem when you when you follow a pathway um, to claim that you're not zero or you're greener or cleaner or someone else or you've got excellent ESG criteria, you've put yourself on a pedestal. It's a it's further to fall. So I think businesses do have to be very careful that they're being authentic and honest in all of these issues. But I thought BCAP, B Corp acted quickly and swiftly and they've subsequently tightened up their governance criteria. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think they did well. Any thoughts, Martin? You? Oh, I, I I agree with Saul. I think um, there are one or two dodgy um, companies that, and I think Saul made the point earlier that if you are Unilever, you start with your Ben and Jerry's uh, brand because it fits their their image, and then but you know, Unilever at its heart. Uh, again, companies like BP have tried and failed, and you know, circumstances have shown that they hadn't actually changed their outlook on life. It was all about greenwash and, and marketing speak. I think. The diff we haven't talked about them in this call, and we've kind of run out of time. But the the generation, the millennials that are, you know, the kids or the or the, the nineteen to to thirty age group, are going to be much more persuasive in this department. I think they've grown up in a time when this all became much more relevant, and I think they will be very skeptical about greenwash and be looking for real differentiators. If you know, not only in where they buy their products from, but equally who they want to work for and what the what the whole package of being a, a man at Unilever or a woman at Unilever, that, that's still going to be a big thing, but it's going to mean a much, much more commitment from the Unilevers of this world to, to be doing the right thing, not just the thing that is commercially the imperative. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay. Well, that 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. I know Saul has to so has to leave because he has another meeting. So Saul, if you want to disappear, please feel free to. I just want to come back to Helen. Helen Sands has put a question in the in the question or in the chat box. So I, if we can pick up on that. So um, do yeah, do head off if you want to. Saul, thank you. Um, so would you agree that the E of ESG and this is probably definitely one for Martin, I guess because we all have a view as well, but is easier to deliver than the S and the G. And also the G, I know, gets people get very confused about that. But um, anecdotally, the S is in particular an area where people are struggling to define what it means. What, what do you think about that? No, I, I agree. I think the E, you sort of mentioned earlier, things like Briam and you've mentioned LEED are very much the, the sort of E. We all care about what well, we can care about energy. We can care about water. Um, uh, and Briam and, and the earlier, you know, adopters of Briam thought they were doing everything they needed to do. The, the big confusion for me with with S is that the the Joe public or the people even in in our property and construction world don't actually know what the S means. So uh, I know it's an acronym that everybody's now got, but I think there's confusion over what what you do there. The G is i think is easier to achieve if you've got a corporate structure and people at the top who understand what their corporate structure is and then they have how they want to ch change it um i think it's it's much harder for professionals working in the uh construction world to get a, a flavor of what the g means i think in the property world it gets passed down from corporate values so again the pilgrim street job we're doing is is actually owned and being developed by credit swiss but by the time their corporate values land on our project it's very watered down and it's a sort of uh well we have to do it but i'm not sure it, it, yet the amount of ownership at that level is fairly hidden this yeah I mean if i could jump in and i i agree everything with what martin said i, I think the problem with s is that because social just means every aspect of our life as we live and that's one of the problems and when we go into construction projects, something um, more tangible for the S for some of our clients when we speak about them or ESGs is diversity, for example, um, whether it's gender, whether it's, it's national diversity from choosing employees in their projects in different region, that's something that's more practical, feasible. Um, the other aspects of S, I agree for construct, well, for employers and for contractors, sometimes it's just difficult for them to put a finger on it. Right? What exactly do they have to do to make the S deliver? And, um, the G is probably easier, as Martin rightly said, where there's a proper corporate structure. So when when we have, we work with banks or we work with developers, the G is obviously met more easily as opposed to when you're working with subcontractors or smaller design companies. And that that seems to be a bit of a theme for this morning, since the size and scale can can be an impact, have an impact as well. But were you going to add something there, Martin? I, I think startups is an interesting place. I've always read my business reading is always kind of focused on on people that write stories about startups and there's one it's an old book now it's probably 20 years old and it's it was called um when giants learn to leap or learn to dance i can't remember if it was written by but it was uh it was all about the breaking up of ge and getting it into smaller subdivisions so that if you've got this massive great elephant um you know you you've actually got to break it down into smaller parts and reinvent it and i think b corp and the whole esg philosophy probably lends itself to but if you're starting a business you just set yourself up to comply with the standards whereas historically for trying to change an old you know organization that's maybe been in existence for 30 40 years that's much much harder exactly thank you okay so i've just while you were chatting talking i put the link to the the amazon cop um for the uh, when the giants learn to dance, um, there's a nice link in the chat as well from John Forbes, who's is incredibly good at all of this sort of stuff. So if anybody's not met John Forbes, he's well worth looking up on the internet. Um, so I think I haven't got any more questions in the Q and A, so that's good. So uh, that makes my life easier. We're five minutes beyond our half an hour, which is is wonderful. Um, and he will be pleased. Um, if anybody does have any questions, would it be unreasonable for me to say martin about the b corp journey if, if anybody wants to drop you an email or anything yeah, like no, that. no no i'm more than happy to talk through our experience and so, uh demy well not demystify i don't think it's that complicated it's a very straightforward process and, and i'm very skeptical about doing process driven things because i find them tedious so my attention span is very small um 
So uh, yeah, happy to do that. Anybody who wants to have a chat. Brilliant. So yeah, so I've just put Martin's website in the chat as well. So it's ashrollservices.co.uk. I think that's right, isn't it? I should know yeah. by now. You should know. Um, you do. <laughs> and, um, and all that remains is to say thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who's, who's tuned in this morning. The recording and a little write-up will be on, on our website very shortly and on YouTube. Massive thanks to Kushbu again for, for helping us out with this. I, we must stop. I think with this is not, not the first time that Kushbu has helped us with the talk and things like that. So it's really great to have her back. And um, thank you, Martin, for joining. And thank you to Saul, who's had to go off and do other things with people who pay him actual money. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.